I have to test one Ruby from this layout of Mozambique Ruby, the center stone. Because I have to document that this stone is uh, natural and has not been heated or altered in any way. It is totally natural as it was found in the nature. Actually, these stones are from the Gemfields Auction. From, this is the catalog from the last Singapore auction. And these were the roughs I checked there. And um, I um, uh, decided to acquire for our collection a set of stones from this lot. They were so nicely matching and different in size that we could cut this layout. And that's the final result, but it needs to be a little bit uh, tested now and confirmed that everything is okay. So we need to take out the center stone. Put this down like that. Okay. This one is an um, amphibole uh, crystal inclusion. And if you, if you have a very nice inclusion like this, very outlined with no additional cracks around, then you know the stone is not heated. It is exactly how it was found in nature. So, uh, so now we have the proof, everything documented. This very beautiful inclusion happens to be exactly in the center stone of the layout. And um, now what we have to do is we have to make some um, high-tech tests that are not visible to the eye, but only to the high-tech machines. We have to measure a stone for um, authenticity, this one, with liquid nitrogen. The laser is now on the stone. We have to position it. So now we're shooting ultraviolet laser to the stone and it creates emission. Light is sent out from the stone. And that depends on the, on the oxidation state of chromium and the quenching effect of iron. So we capture this um, with a spectrometer and it shows it on the graph. For example, here we have the nanometers of the light from 200 to 1000. The laser was here at 405, but what the stone is sending us out are these peaks. Actually, they are red color peaks, a whole series of them. So every gemstone sends out a different pattern of um, what we call photoluminescence, uh, light induced by a laser. And, um, and uh, this pattern we register and then we compare heated, no heated uh, stones from different origin and we keep them in our registry. And that's a fingerprint on what intensity we have and how much is coming out. And this is all different from every gemstone to another one and, and different origins. We have about uh, 40,000 reference stones. We measure them all through and make bookkeeping and homework. And that is the information we apply to the customer stones and to the stone that come here also from Mozambique. And so we'll be catching up a lot of things. It's kind of a secret weapon, you know. It's an arms race between the guys that making new treatments or cheating stones. And, uh, and us, you know, who playing the polis in the chem industry and have to go on after that. The Gemfields auction for rough rubies in Singapore is probably the biggest in the world uh, right now. So we had to go there and looking and then there was an opportunity to get uh, very good stones and uh, uh, get an important collection for the laboratory. <laughs> Nowadays the major source for uh, rough rubies is this big mining operation in Mozambique. And uh, so we're testing stones for customers. And so we have to know what is the source and we have to analyze the inclusions and all the properties in order to compare them with the customer stones.
it was a really unique opportunity, you know, to go to that auction and uh, see in a very short amount of time, like thousands of stones. Normally you have to look one by one, they appear here and there, and you need like almost a decade to see these number of stones. So it's like a fast train of experience. You're looking at the silk with a microscope or? With a torch. With a torch, huh? I mean it in magnification or? No, no, but yes. Yeah, the C axis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the C axis is, is mostly there where the silk is. But it's still fine. It's a gold on Yeah, it's a gold, not too much. Huh? Only one side, huh? This, this is another grid. And you can see the difference with what you are looking to be. This is more tabula, okay, it's yeah. cubic. And basically, you will all cut them in the C axis. How, how you would determine the C axis? By eyes. By eyes, no microscope. No. In, in which light you use for that? Natural light. Yeah, here, you, you want to look through here? See two colors? Yes, yes, yes. And now I put it perpendicular here. Now you see two colors? Yeah. No, now you don't see two colors anymore. Yeah, huh? yeah. You don't see two colors. Yeah, exactly. And now you see two colors? Yeah. Two colors, huh? You put on the side. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Good one. You see what happened? You have an extreme homogeneity. It's like a group shape, okay? So, we sorry, the, what, what point was that? The, so you mean the color saturation? This table, this table number five, okay? Yeah. Schedule H. So the guy who wants to buy, I have he has to bid on all. He has to buy everything. It's extreme homogeneity. The guy who buys, who buys this, he will make set straight away. Look here. Yeah. It's a simple law. So you're saying uh, the guy who buys this lot can make immediately an, uh, a, a pair, set. right? A set, yeah. A very high quality set. Uh, the lots, they were quite different. Some were like very high value, some were like a little bit lower value. And then they were also mixed. So the private viewing, you're viewing yourself and looking these stones very carefully. One of the flat stones in here would be 12.5. But within the lots, there were like uh, a lot of surprises. So you had to be very cautious. Very important is to be very critical with the stones. You don't have to go there, look a stone and think, oh, it's nice, red and big, and oh, it has to be a stone over 10 carat. Every single stone, you have to very carefully look at it and think it can be the end of your project. You can totally overpay it. You can lose everything that you made before just in one or two stones. So you, you have to be, you know, it's, it's to be or not to be experienced with the stones. But I, I, I would say, to say that primary produces that, I, I, I'm, I'm skeptical. Probably one primary does and the other doesn't. Yeah, uh, yeah. But from see, what that's we one see, not, right? one is not. Mm. See that? Can you see that? Piece? So do you think this is just what higher iron hunting? Yeah. No, I mean, what my theory is, yeah, I, I, spontaneously, is that once you have a primary which the stones did not move away from, mm. once you have a primary and this primary is fluorescent, then a high percentage of that production will be fluorescent because it's not mixing in from all different spots where it's formed. To so get, then it's the spot itself yeah. and the geology that made it. Mm -hmm. And uh, once you're moving away to another primary, it might not be the same. It's true. And then, uh, then, then it's the, the lucky, the lucky spot, you know. Mm. That's the lucky spot. But it's very amazing. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's fantastic. Yeah. Doctor. Hey. Oh, you are doing <laughs> Yeah, certified. I learned a lot from the from the buyers. So one strategy is, for example, you want to make a big layout of stones, a matching one. A very a slightly change in size and then entering into a very important center stone and you want to make a necklace. Maybe you have already your end consumer in mind that is asking you all the time to find something like that. And then when you see a lot in the, in the ocean, you have to see whether it's possible from the stones to make such 
such a necklace. Or do you decide that I make a necklace and one or the other of the stone may be suitable for a single stone? Oh, yeah. So the story is this is uh, the best color from the lock. I think the best one. Yeah, yeah. It's shining already before it's cut, you know. Three stars. And if once you have you found single stones that you are sure with your cutter that this one is going to cover your total investment on the lot, you make a discovery, you know. You, from your experience before, from, from cutting these stones, you have an experience and you get, uh, get uh, advice and you say, okay, if this stone comes out good, it will cover the whole lot, so the rest is like profit and we can make additional smaller stones and we can do this. And you have to decide whether you're going to keep the stone exactly how it is or whether you have to heat treat the stone a little bit or warm it and have a kind of a strategy, you know, on the stones. So you have to separate them out. This one stays natural, this one will be warm, this one will be for set, this one will be for single stone. Yes. And then the uh, table will be here, so in this direction should not much orange coming out, you know. The light power is too much, it's difficult to see. Buying it off is a very risky business, you know. You actually only know the value once you cut the stone. Because beauty and value comes only after cut. We're using quite a few stones, huh, the guys? If you put the face this side, it will be very flat bottom. This side is good for face and good bottom, but it's not good for the color. So it's very difficult. So you have to put this factor into equation when you buy. You have to have a kind of a safety limit and if it goes bad, that you're not losing too much. But once you have competitors next to you that bidding for the same round, you need to get a lot, you have to go to the maximum, maximum that is potentially there for a rough stone. So you might overbid the stone in order to get it. This stone, if there's no crank, it, uh, though the rough is 12 and a half carat, it can cut nearly uh, seven and a half carat, but like because of this uh, inclusion here, it will cut only six carats. So I have to be extremely careful, huh? Yeah, yeah. Because of the value of the stone is high, so the estimation has to be very cor uh, correct. Correct. Whether it's a five, six or seven yes, carat makes yeah. a huge difference. Huge difference. One stone in there that had a crack, and this crack let drop the price of this stone like to only 25%. If you tilt here, oh, it's yeah. a very bad crack. Oh, yeah, yeah. Huh? Mm. Can you see it? Yeah, on the, on the side here. Yeah. Yes, here. Yeah. It has gone right inside. And this cannot be taken out. If you take out, the, it will be a very flat stone. Because here you have to take out the silk. Here you see, up to here it's silk. If you not look carefully these three, four stones and picking up that one stone that has a, a, a lower value, you would have overpaid a lot and you have to surprise later, you know. And so I was like, oh, these buyers, they have to look very carefully, you know, with their money on the table. You have to cut the stone somewhere in the world where there are experienced cutters. And uh, there are a few uh, very important cutting centers in the world. I don't want to say which one is more important, but one of them is Thailand, one of them is Sri Lanka. So uh, it, it went to one of the important cutting centers in the world. So we ended up in Sri Lanka. Come in, come in. Please. So we are looking at this 22 carat stone. And Mr. Kunstri is saying that it's uh, quite a clean stone. Yes. And the surface color of orange and brown may be will go away after preform. Yes. Like looking at cushion maybe. Maybe this, like this. Yes, cushion. Like this. Yes. Yeah. When you shorter the stone like this, uh -huh. it's going to be cushion. Square cushion. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we have 22 here, but we, we think, do you think we can keep 10? No, we expected like 12. 12. 12. After polish. That is impressive because in our book, we had only written for this stone 9 to 10. Uh, what do you think of this stone? This is the other one from the big lot. It's 19 carat rough. Mm -hmm. This one we liked very much over there. 
because this one is a very good ship to start off with. This is a cushion ship. Cushion ship, yeah. Cushion ship, yeah. It will so, be like top quality. This, this looks to be like will be top quality. They have a lot of experience, maybe more so in sapphires, but also recently in uh, rubies. And they have a special cutting style there, developed. And extremely experienced cutters. So you have to bring the uh, most important rough that matters to you to the best cutter in the world or some of the best cutters in the world. Thank you very much. I can have a look to the cutting of yes, one of please. the most important rubies in the world that doesn't happen every day. So it's very exciting. It's so all very exciting. It's very exciting. See, so it's an important cutter. Yeah, it is the best cutter in Sri So when I come in this room, you know, the guys moved in with their personal equipment into the dealer's office, you know. I was like, what is this, you know? Is this an expert tool or what? You know, anybody can buy that, you know. But it's not the machine. It's the experience, you know. When you look into the preformer in his hands, you know, how he can make the smallest angle with the rough and turn it and make it and make this decision, you know, to put the table here and then he takes it out and he grinds the stone down from 20 carats to 15 to 14 and he takes it off and off and the carrots come down you know all the investors are like oh my god you know look at this oh, what is happening you know they have to trust him totally you know and he's very cool the guy one is 150 other one is sharp and smooth ah, sharp and smooth okay When you look at his hand, it's, it's, it's not actually his hand anymore. It's like a part of the machine. He doesn't need to have a, a dimension meter to find out what is, is the best dimension. He tastes it with his hand. It makes a 3D image in his brain somehow, and he can feel it and see it. The right angle. Eight to nine carat over. That's what we expect. When we looked at the stone at the auction, we played our worksheet and we looked at the stone very carefully. We estimated eight to nine carat. The people that have cut or preformed stones their whole life, they will have so many mistakes made in their life and so much experience gained of it. They will not make it on your stone. They did it before. That is better. Yeah, otherwise the weight is gone already. Yes, yes. Now he's studying the stone, he gets the advice from the cutter now. And then he goes back talking on the, uh, on the uh, cutting process, deforming, weight loss process. Ah, this is a diamond blade. Yeah. They have all these uh, details of how fast the, the, the wheel has to spin, what kind of metal this uh, wheel has to be what kind of uh, powder, the diamond powder they use, and the grains, and the quality of the diamond powder. And then they have the goniometer to make the angles and to very precisely leverage it with the hand in connection with the, with the goniometer in three dimensions and to make the facets in the right angle. So now we have to decide when you're making these angles and the number of steps, how many you make and how much bulge you want to make the stone in order to keep the weight high but still have sparkling um, reflections face up. There was one stone that had a, a little bit of a blue zone, you know. And the guys managed to tilt the table such a little bit against the optical axis and shift the culet on the stone such a little bit to one side that when looking at the stone, the blue zone was gone. Is it there still, the blue? It's, I think, hidden. Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> look at this big face. Big face. It looks like 12 carat. It wasn't the light didn't pass through it. Okay. Okay. It was perfectly red. And this little blue zone that normally gives a little bit of purplish overtone was gone, you know. That was a master strike. I couldn't believe it, you know. So then the stone, uh, the stone came back from uh, uh, Sri Lanka and came back uh, to Thailand and, uh, and then you look in the stone and you see uh, minor uh, imperfections. 
and particularly around the girdle, that is the middle part between the upper and the lower part of the stone, the crown and pavilion, that is the girdle. And this girdle was only polished. So what you can do is you can put a lot of small facets on the girdle. So you make one, one facet, next, 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 maybe 100 facets around the girdle. So when the light passes through the stone, it brings you back the 3 to 5% of lost light into the stone. So he will cutting the crown first. Yeah, he's gonna be cutting the crown. There is a little, there is a little small hole. Or small hole. On yeah, he closing the, the hole on first. The table and on the crown. So we have only 17 points to work with. It's 10.17. Now our instruction is it cannot go below 10. So, so he works first on the crown, which is visible. Yes. Yeah, he wants to make the facets on the side a bit more equal and, and the shine and the luster might come out a little bit more. So there was this uh, skilled cutter again that is uh, used to improve the stone after it is already there almost and makes these extra facets, you know, just also with the hand, you know, like this, 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 this very small, small around the girdle, you know, it was fascinating, you know. Still have a small hole? Yeah. Okay. In the pavilion side now we're looking, there is two holes, but this, there's one big hole which I don't think we can take out because it's going to affect the weight and he said the proportion of the stone. So we might have to have sacrificed and leave that the way it is. And then there's a hole right on the top which we're going to try to take out now. There's still another hole here. This is the one that he doesn't want to play around with because he feels that if he goes too much, it's not going to be equal on the two sides. So he's going to leave this hole as it is on the stone. So how much is it now? 10.15. And when you started, we had? 10.17. When you blind made the facets connect with one another, okay. all, all of them, and he was able to take out two little holes, and we only lost two points. To that side, please. So that's the one. This, this is the one, yes. This, this is the one that we have just. Uh, the material is very clean. So, seeing this is a, one of the first time that they're exactly rough to a very expensive stone has been filled. Huh? Exactly, I think so. I think these yeah. stones are quietly done and and usually it's never filmed. And you don't know from the beginning what comes out later, so you cannot Absolutely. anticipate the outcome. The material is very clean. Yeah. Very clean material, very crystal. Yeah, yeah, very crystal. This is one of the rarest ruby in the world. It's not the rarest, but no. it's in the league. It's in the league. And rubies don't get so nice, and so big. And it's very fantastic opportunity we got to take this stone straight from the rough up to the finished ready form. Yeah, that has never been done before. Look at the piece of rough in Singapore and to more or less decide what will come out is, is an art. It's, it's, very, art. it's a very difficult yes. art.
And this is a, an amazing collection of rubies. <laughs> that is for sure. Uh, cut in various shapes, a pear shape, a long cushion, a square cushion, an antique cushion, a heart shape, and an oval. How many years are you now in trade, Sampal? Well, I started when I was 18, so I'm 54 now. So I'm 36 years in the trade. And how many times have you cut such a collection in your life? First time. I have never done this before. I have never seen this before. Six rubies like this in stock at any one time is a lifetime experience. It's, it's, it's not easy. It's never been easy. The first auction, we got these beautiful stones like this. The following auction, there were no such stones, six stones in one lot of this quality. So that was our dream. We had to follow mm -hmm. up this one time. We fulfilled the dream. Well, that we had to fly all, <laughs> all over the world to, to do that. To do that, of yeah, course. The yes. stone was found in Mozambique, then it was auctioned, auctioned in, in Singapore. Singapore, then it was cut in Sri Lanka, then it was recut in Thailand. And, and, and now so, it's ready. And now it's here.